Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today as we dialogue about white fright. My name is Kendall. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm an MSU Denver junior in the Art History and African Studies degree program. Before we get started, just a couple of things to note. I am recording this little mini lecture from the comfort of my own home. Um, unfortunately, living uh, in an apartment means that I am not free from back ground and outside noise, please disregard those extra sounds. Let's go over a quick agenda before we get started. I will do a land acknowledgement and a BIPOC statement. We will review event norms, dialogue norms, and aspects of what a dialogue is. Then I'll begin a little mini lecture about the historical manifestations of white fright. Once the mini lecture is over, the dialogue can begin. This is an excerpt from the MSU, Metropolitan State University of Denver, Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Today, we honor and acknowledge that we are on in traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations. This area was also the site of trade, hunting, gathering, and healing for many other native nations. We recognize the indigenous peoples as the original stewards of the land. Let us also acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land on which we gather. We pay our respects to them and give thanks through our continued advocacy for all tribal nations and the ancestors of this place. The BIPOC statement I have written, and it is as follows. CMEI acknowledges the BIPOC community through allyship, action, and cultural competency. We acknowledge ongoing systematic oppression, socioeconomic disparities, and racial injustices that are experienced by our community every day. We embody allyship aimed at disrupting the oppressive systems through action, support, education, and the creation of space for BIPOC leaders and voices. Thank you for your continued allyship. So let's get into what a dialogue is. Just to be super clear, this is not a debate or a discussion. This is a respectful com conversation with the goal of idea thought development with the use of active listening skills and acknowledgement of others' thoughts and ideas. This is not a place for hate or anger. We acknowledge those emotions, but please understand this is a space for learning, unlearning, and relearning. I'm explaining this distinction to promote healthy communication and conversation within ourselves and our peers. Please use I statements, own and hone your thoughts, because this is meant to be a safe space. The norms for the events, we commit to confidentiality. What is learned here can leave. What is shared here stays here. We wanna create a brave space for people to honestly engage. Our primary commitment is to learn from each other. And in that, please expect and accept a lack of closure. This is a big one. This is merely a start of a conversation. We will be challenging assumptions and pushing ourselves to think in ways that we may not be used to, which will leave many of us with lingering questions and thoughts. That's good. But please monitor your airtime. In the dialogue portion, we do want everyone to speak up, but just be mindful of how much time and space you're taking. We will work with the awareness of the status differences between anyone who's engaging in a dialogue. This is a vulnerable conversation, uh, thoughts that we may share, and we want to respect the limits that people set for themselves. So in that, when we challenge, we will challenge the idea and not the person. Please do not demean, devalue, or put down another's lived experiences, but let's discuss those differences and how they're interpreted. And please, we must trust that everyone is trying to do their best and we are co-learners. A quick disclaimer and trigger warning. This lecture will have racist and offensive images and language. There will be also talk of rape. Your mental health comes first. Please leave at any time or do anything you need to maintain mental and physical health. We can direct you to campus resources if you're an MSU student. Otherwise, we can do our best to provide assistance beyond that. Another disclaimer, 
This is not an attack on white people. This lecture is meant to discuss a basic understanding of the development around white fright. I've allotted about 20 minutes for this preservation. Please note there'll be inevitable gaps as I'm trying to discuss major changes and events that cultivate our implicit bias in modern Western gaze. So let's get into it. And you know, I really do love horror movies and I love them because ghosts and demons and monsters are fun and unrealistic and in a way a form of escapism. And these are just a few of my favorites. It's the suspension of disbelief that I love. This is because humans are a lot more scarier than me to me than movies like this. Today we'll discuss the modern understanding of white fright as it is the foundation of the perpetuation and mutation of hate and implicit bias that leads to systematic oppression, prejudice, xenophobia, and racism. So I'm sure you're wondering what the heck white fright is. Again, I do want to make it extremely clear that this mini lecture is a dissection of the Western gaze of the white European oppression and standard that is embedded into the fabric of our society. This is a, not an attack on those who identify as white in the United States. This is the dismantling of the generational curse of irrational and fearful hate. So we will take an art historical approach to understanding the formulation of irrational fear that is innate to those in power and positions of power. Modern social media has become a dangerous tool to spread hate as much as it is an inspiring avenue for human connection before our gadgets Art served the same purpose, whether it was carved into stone, wood, or as decoration on a public space in the form of advertisements in a French salon, in urban galleries, exhibits, and human, excuse me, and history museums. This quote media, or rather variety of mediums, set standards for educating the masses that come in the form of pseudo-scientific and propagandist aesthetic. As much, of it is, as much as it is a skillful, ornate expression of human existence. We will begin our visual journey in ancient times with a global lens, then focus our attention on the developments in the United States. Understanding white fright. There are different components to the development. We're going to do our best to touch bases on a lot of these different aspects in a chronological order. So when we think of white fright, we have to understand the foundational fear as it starts to be presented in our artworks around the protection of white women's virtue. Now, you may have also, when you saw or read white fright, your brain may be said white flight, F-L-I-G-H-T. And that is something different. That's actually the departure of white people from a place such as urban neighborhoods or schools that are increasingly or predominantly populated by minorities. Per Webster, or excuse me, Miriam Webster, white flight is the departure of whites from places that, like I said, are increasingly populated. But white flight and white flight go hand in hand by way of white flight is the action of white fright. It is the practice of white fright. We have to understand in the formulation of what white fright is. We have to take it back in time as we will see and understand the fear of barbarians, the other, a violent connotation of warring peoples and how it creates a foundation for future events. Please understand that white fright and the, and the concept around it is a rational fear weaponized, sprouting from paranoia of those who hold powerful positions in society. You can also think of another example as uh, a king or queen worried about assassination attempts. Implicit bias. When we understand white fright, 
and we understand implicit bias, the implicit aspect is how ingrained it is in our society. We have a bias win. Rather than being neutral, we prefer or have an aversion to a person or group of people. This describes the attitude towards people and is associated with stereotypes within our conscious and unconscious mind. It becomes the origin and foundation around how we interact with racism, oppression, prejudice, xenophobia. There's a couple of quotes to keep in mind. The white fright of Muslim cabals looking to harm the US apparently outrates the constitutional right to freedom of religion. Like that, the dread of the mythical Mexican rapist. They, BIPOC folks, aren't entitled enough to hold the expectation that the rights of others should be suspended because of their own fears. Everyone is scared sometimes, but the worrisome part is the belief that the rest of the world or a country or a member of a religion need to sacrifice certain freedoms in order to mollify the angst of others. That citation for the quote will be found in the description box below. I just want to briefly discuss our historical agenda. On this more global note, we're going to look at the domino effect that set up humanity to embrace this fear as fact. We're looking at what a barbarian is in depiction. Islamic expansion, transatlantic slave trade. In the United States, the continuation and the narrowing looking at Jim Crow, civil rights movement, and the modern day Karen. And these are broad, we're jumping around a bit, but please bear with me. The Barbarian. We are looking at two photos here. One of a Nubian captive from the late Middle Kingdom and Egypt. In photo two, we are looking at a Roman creation, bronze relief of a Roman soldier, soldier excuse me, and barbarian. When we're looking at photo one, we are noting the arms of the Nubian boy are held freely at his side with palms turned upward in a gesture of voluntary submission. It is answered by the lion's attitude more seemingly protective than menacing on surface. Take a moment to look at what this depiction could mean to a societal standard. That is what we're, we're dissecting. We are gonna look at hierarchical structure, noting who is larger, who is smaller, and how that translates to power. The lion representing uh, the ruling or the ruler at the time with the Nubian in a submissive position. What standard is that sending to the masses as they look at something? Now keep in mind, this is also small. Small equals movability. It equals a more of a mass connection, something that can fit in the palm of your hand, something carried in a pocket. This casualness is something that's also a foundational aspect to, to make a thought or a standard real. How casual is this being depicted? The casual depictions of triumph and defeat. Now, the other aspect is subduing a fear of attack of these people. A reminder to anyone who looks at it of who is in power. Of course, generalized forms is something that's going to be innate in art history for a very long time. In some cases, it seems more individualized, but most power, or excuse me, most images are setting standard for what someone of a lower status looks like, what someone of a higher status looks like. Blanket statement versus individual. And the excerpt of which I read it comes from the Met Museum. That is their description of. But let's take it a bit further. Now, when we look at photo two, 
Again, we're looking at this bronze statue of a Roman soldier. Now, the barbarian in question is a Germanic people. When we look at these two images, we have a loser and a winner of history. These depictions inform the viewer of the conquering power. The depiction of the barbarian further justifies the conquering. The Romans thought the Germanic people barbarians as the, as the Egyptians saw the Nubians or Kushites as barbarians. Ironically, both Germanic and Nubian peoples were hired as mercenaries by those who claim them to be barbarians. What would cause a social shift? Well, in the case of Egypt, the Kushites and the Kushite kingdom come into power, shaking up the dynamic of them as enslaved or hired mercenaries. What changed with the dynamic between the Roman and Germanic peoples when maybe they didn't want to comply? The conquered are depicted and the submissive are predicted in such a way. We wanna note clothing choices. We wanna note these certain elements of power Roman soldier, the pride of a lion, the intensity of a lion. Now enslavement at this time was not chattel enslavement as what we see in the transatlantic slave trade. Chattel enslavement, indifference, is in closely connected to the economic success or failure. Meaning that with the removal of chattel enslavement, economic systems would collapse because that is how they are addressing their labor, exploited labor. Enslavement and servitude were a way to subdue captives, a way to deal with them, with the uncivilized enemy that may threaten power. It is a long time war tactic to enslave your enemy because that is how you conquer and divide. We're gonna jump forward in time. Now this is going to be after the establishment of the transatlantic slave trade. There needs to be a justification for enslavement of people in the case of indigenous peoples of America. But when we're looking at how pseudoscience has established the justifications for why a certain class of people, a certain group, race of people would be subhuman. So keeping in mind also the Islamic expansion, that started around 620 AD lasting for over a thousand years. Harem scenes and slave market scenes are a way to show audiences the potential danger, danger of Islamic invaders. Now, something to note when we think of the audience, these paintings were created not for those of color, but those in power. And at this time, you're looking at great powers of Europe. So with that being said, if these are the images being shown, depicting people who had no say in their depictions, what standard is it setting? What is it telling those? And why in such a casual manner is this dangerous? So we are going to note the high contrast between the pale skin of a nude woman or provocatively dressed women in positions that make them submissive and promote danger. They are being held in captivity by darker images. The exposure of a woman's body adds the element of sexual exploitation at the hands of non-Christian and non-white peoples. What message is this sending around the fear and need to protect white women? Why the focus on white women? Well, women as a whole tend to be labeled as carriers of their culture. What does that mean? for women identities, knowing how to cook certain foods to continue certain legacy, forcing to hold up traditions, rules, regulations, standards, and expectations around marriage and how that can aid not themselves, but their others, but their family, the commoditization of women. So in discussing the transatlantic slave trade, that upon Spain's expansion, looking for new Spain, looking to cultivate further crop, encountering the Tiano people in the Caribbean, encountering native nations within Central and South America, 
upon landing in Northern America, encountering indigenous peoples there. Before the full enslavement of Africans, there was an attempt to assimilate and to save the indigenous peoples in which they encountered. Justifications of enslavement based on capitalistic labor needs for sugar and trade expansion. Non-Christian, dubbed dumb, and only useful for labor needs start to become themes to justify the mistreatment of indigenous and African people. Then for spice, let's throw in the white savior complex because we have to save the heathens as further justification of when then the depictions, exploration, academic research is all going to be through the lens of these justifications to keep those in power in power and to justify the treatment of others. And as I mentioned pseudoscience, I mentioned that a few times, what we're really referring to is the solidification of the actions that we have spoken of um, aiding the fear around white women's virtue in the enlightenment period. It is defined as a period of rigorous scientific, political, philosophical discourse that uh, characterized European society. Other cultures were studied to prove European superiority. Scholarships with heavily laced a racist lens discredited non-white peoples as being backwards and in need of Western influence. Phrenology, the photo that we see in the middle here, and other disciplines saw accredited confirmation of their bias. Medical racism was solidified with the Age of Enlightenment and misinformation that existed in this, it was established in this time period still exists today. Things like Black people don't feel pain the same way other races do. We start to see superficial association with cranium sizes, face shape. We see a picture of Sarah Bartman and her exploitation of the body. And we also have to understand in the development of, because now we've jumped even further in time. Even if we take it back to the artifacts we saw in the beginning, the use of imagery to promote standards and ideas of society is a practice that is still in existence. So we are looking at a few different depictions and let's discuss them. First off, we're going to start with the movie poster in the top corner. This is the Birth of the Nation movie poster, 1915. What you have is D.W. Griffin's inspiration from a book prompting the use of the emerging medium of film and is accredited for reviving the KKK. During the time of its release, there was a rise in hate crimes, white mob lynchings, brutalization and mutilation of black people. Black Wall Streets were burned, black towns submerged in quote, new lakes in an uptick in violence as media has confirmed. And at this time, politically, the federal government had backed off on promises to marginalize identities in the country, further confirming white supremacy. The white woman, Caddy Corner, to the poster, is actually going to be, the white woman screaming, is a screenshot clip from Birth of a Nation, note blackface behind. With the ease of the casual nature of cartoons and imagery is a dehumanizing practice that chips away at the identity of a person, making it easier to be harmful and violent against. Dr. Seuss in our bottom corner, Japanese internment camps during the first war. On the far left, we see minstrel show, white eyes, dark face, big smiles, a caricature. This character below is Jim Crow, thought to be established by seeing a crippled black man walking. A white man thought it was so funny, took the clothes and exaggerated the movements and turned it into a comedy act and a dehumanizing practice. In a modern age, 
social media has become a tool to connect us, but it is also a tool of hate. What message is the United States sending globally? What has it sent globally? Because as racist imports are concerned, in 2011, approximately one fourth of the objects in the Jim Crow Museum were produced in other countries, including Australia, Brazil, Canada, England, Hong Kong, Japan, Mexico, and Taiwan. You can say that the warehouses in which these items are being created were outsourced. So this is the same fear that says the LGBTQ community were full of sexual predators and pedophiles as media representation depicts them as social workers and social, excuse me, sex workers and social pariahs. Jewish people are out to steal money. This is the same fear that says the Roma people are thieves, that says black children are born unruly. This is the same fear that let the long list of indigenous women become cold case files in their missing status. It is the same fear that follows black and, black and brown folks through stores to make sure they're not stealing. This picture that we're looking at is a license plate from 1964. When art is created, we must ask ourselves, who are the images for? With oppressive images, what message of fear is being expressed? Subliminal, overt, covert? What is the importance of imagery to the human experience? With that importance, how are those images damaging? And how does the exposure of casual racism affect implicit bias? The root of white man's hatred is terror, a bottomless and nameless terror, which focuses on this dread figure, an entity which lives only in his mind. What white people have to do, Baldwin once said, is try to find out in their hearts, why it is necessary for them to have a Negro in the first place. Because I am not a Negro, I am a man. If I'm not the Negro here, and if you invented him, you the white people invented him, then you have to find out why. And the future of our country depends on that, whether or not it is able to ask that question. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you have a productive dialogue.